Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Danish Habib, and I will be your moderator. The topic of our webinar today is how a PPI GSI 94 became Dean of a uh, Global Management School. And that is, of course, our guest today, Dr. Sopal here. Um, I will pass it on to him to introduce himself for a brief background and go over our agenda for today. If you do have any questions, feel free to write them in the chat. And we'll also have a Q&A at the end. Uh, for you to uh, turn on your mic if you feel more comfortable doing that. So I will pass it on to uh, Dr. Sopalier now for our webinar. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here. I'm Sopal Ear, uh, an associate, a senior associate dean uh, for student success, actually, these days. I was senior associate dean for undergraduate and global develop uh, undergraduate programs and global development last year, but uh, now senior associate dean for student success. And um, this whole talk is about who I am anyway, so you don't need a mini version of who I am uh, right now. So I'll pass it back to Danish for the sort of program agenda, and then and then he'll bring it back to me so that I can actually get into my talk. All right, thank you. So the agenda for today is basically Dr. So Paul here will go over his background, um, his connection with PPIA, his previous experiences at the World Bank and the UNDP, and we'll also talk about the Thunderbird School of Global Management and specifically the Masters of Global Management program, which is something you can possibly explore. So uh, I will pass it on to Dr. So Paul here now to go over the specifics. Thank you. Great. Thanks again for everyone's uh, attendance today. So um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to to discuss all this. I have a few slides uh, to kind of describe my journey. So I was a public policy and international affairs uh, junior summer institute uh, participant fellow in 1994 at Princeton, uh, what was then known as the Woodrow Wilson School of uh, Public and International Affairs, and is now known as the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. Um, and um, I, I've been at the Thunderbird School now for about a year and a half, almost two years. Um, I am te I teach courses on international organizations, uh, global affairs on Asia, and uh, both in person and online. I am not the dean of the school, to be clear. I am a dean, uh, you know, one of the deans. Um, and so it's really my pleasure to, to talk about all of this and to talk about my journey and to share it with you. Um, let me start by saying, you know, all of the things that, that, that I am today, I, I, I wouldn't have imagined possible uh, back in the early to mid 1990s when I was uh, an undergraduate uh, at UC Berkeley and uh, I looked like this. Uh, so this, this, was, this was me, uh, I think around 1994. Uh, two years before Harry Potter, and this story of what I'm about to tell you for the next half hour is really how uh, I got to where I am. Now, some of you who who know me know the story from uh, a, t a TED talk I gave uh, in 2009. That's on TED.com about my family's escape from the Khmer Rouge. Uh, really, a six-minute talk uh, that described uh, sort of the 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 journey and and what my mom had to do. And I, I, again, I had six minutes then to tell my story today. I have a few more minutes to share that with you, to share that journey from being a public policy and international affairs junior summer institute um, fellow to uh, at Princeton to becoming one of, one of the deans here at, at the Thunderbird School of Global Management at uh, Arizona State University. So at the end of uh, that TED talk, uh, my mother was there in the audience and she, uh, uh, this is the thing about Ted, they, they always know how to do showmanship, right? So they flew her in uh, and she was able to, to get uh, a standing ovation from the audience, Here, here's mom. Uh, my wife who was eight months pregnant with our first child at the time, uh, was there to accompany her. And this being Ted, uh, they had some big names in the audience. They had uh, Bill Gates that year, he released some mosquitoes into the auditorium to to scare people about malaria, a prop uh, that was very effective. But within six months of, of that TED talk, um, my mother passed away and it really 
kind of made me think about the legacy she left behind and the lessons learned from her life. And so this talk is a little bit about that. It's, it's, it's certainly influenced the work that I've done, the reason why I've, I've written books on aid dependence in Cambodia, um, how foreign assistance undermines democracy and uh, on China's involvement in Cambodia, and most recently my book on, on, on uh, viral sovereignty and the political economy of pandemics, what explains how countries handle outbreaks. But the journey I'll talk about for you today is this PPIA fellow to a dean in six acts, uh, first Cambodia, then Vietnam, uh, third France, then America, and then the world, and then becoming a dean. So just uh, just to get right into it, you know, just like uh, This American Life, the, the radio show, Act One, Cambodia, um, really, you know, just to describe to you what the country was like before I was born and the years right before my birth, 1969 here, my parents, uh, mom and dad, uh, in what appears to be a joyful picture, um, and the country is at relative peace, our house, a mansion really, uh, in the capital city of Phnom Penh was, uh, you know, had, was, was just one of the, one of the possessions we had as, as a, as a bourgeois family living in, in the capital city. Um, Phnom Penh itself was, uh, relatively peaceful, uh, beautiful architecture, uh, movies being screened in the, um, uh, movie theaters by the King, the Prince of Cambodia, the head of state of Cambodia, Prince Sihanouk, he was a, a aspiring director. So he made this film called The Little Prince here, Le Petit Prince. But across the world, uh, President Nixon pointed to Cambodia. Uh, this is in April, on April 30th, 1970. And he was enshrining a new idea in his so-called Nixon doctrine, uh, which he described as there are no combat uh, no American combat troops in Cambodia. There are no American combat advisors in Cambodia. There will be no American combat troops or advisors in Cambodia. We will aid Cambodia. Cambodia is the Nixon doctrine in its purest form. This was November 1971. And what you see uh, in this map of, 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 of Cambodia and, and Vietnam and Thailand is the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which cuts across Cambodia and allows the, the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese communists to resupply as a result, because they're in Cambodian territory and Cambodia is technically part of the Vietnam War, at least not officially. But what did uh, Nixon's uh, uh, doctrine mean in its purest form? It meant that B-52s would be dropping their uh, payload on, on Cambodia. It meant that while there would not officially be uh, American troops uh, fighting uh, the war in Cambodia. There would be American troops uh, flying airplanes and dropping bombs. And so, uh, you know, this led, of course, to a country that suffered terribly during the Vietnam War. 113,716 sites were bombed by the U.S. Air Force in Cambodia. And uh, the operation was called Operation Menu. Uh, so there was breakfast, uh, lunch, uh, tea, uh, dinner, and all of these meals were uh, locations that needed to be bombed uh, daily, uh, places that had been picked for the next target. And of course, with that uh, came uh, eventually the fall of Phnom Penh on April 17, 1975 to the Khmer Rouge because of the withdrawal of the United States. And um, the, the, the fact, some would argue later, the intensity of the bombing led to the Khmer Rouge basically uh, winning over people and, uh, and uh, themselves becoming really angry at, uh, at those who they perceived as being pro-American. So when they arrived in April 1975, the Khmer Rouge took over the country and, uh, and took over Phnom Penh. And, and it was not that day, at least, uh, supposed to be you know, a frightening day. Uh, they were young uh, teenagers who had uh, decided that, uh, the, that the regime in place was corrupt and that they should take over as, um, as the new leaders. Uh, many of them uh, without any kind of education, really. So you had, you had children taking over for uh, adults. Uh, you had crazy people like this guy thinking that he was going to take over. He was not actually one of the Khmer Rouge, but he thought he was going to become 
the head of state that day. But two million people were evacuated from Phnom Penh, including my own family in about three days. I tell this story because I want you to understand where I come from in terms of what uh, my um, sort of uh, uh, origin story is. And our family was essentially expelled into the countryside, uh, forced to move out now under the excuse that you know the, the US was gonna bomb Phnom Penh. And so it would be safer to be in the countryside only for three days, they said. Of course, it turned out to be for years. Um, and there was no American bombing had, had planned or, or intended. Uh, the leaders of the Khmer Rouge were these people here, all uh, mostly men. Uh, Pol Pot here, uh, sit, seated in this car train, um, and uh, known as Brother Number One, uh, who hid his identity for so long because there was no need to to come out of the shadows. Um, the only way that I can describe Cambodia. Uh, are, to use the words of Michael Paternity, who said that once upon a time, there was a regime so evil that it created an anti-society where torture was currency, uh, music, books, and love were abolished. Uh, the regime ruled for four years and murdered nearly two million of its citizens, a quarter of the population. Uh, and for many of you, the idea of two million people, it's like Stalin's famous quote, um, you know, the death of, uh, of, of one man is a tragedy to the world, but the death of a million is a statistic. Uh, not that I agree with Stalin, but this particular quote, uh, in fact, I think uh, has essential truth in it. It's very hard to understand, to wrap your head around millions of people dead, right? Two million dead. And even when you look at a quarter of the population, one out of four people, it's, it's so difficult um, to even fathom that. But um, I'm gonna take you now to a place in Phnom Penh that exists today uh, and uh, it's called Tool Slide Genocide Museum, but was a torture center that uh, during the Khmer Rouge period, uh, 60, up to 16,000 people uh, were killed, um, tortured to death. In. And it was a former high school that um, became a, a living hell for those 16,000 people um, behind barbed wire and in, in offices and classrooms turned into torture chambers. The fascinating thing about um, the equipment used for, for torture, uh, years ago when I gave a talk uh, in Oslo at Oslo Freedom Forum 2010, there was a woman there from, uh, from Iran who uh, had <laughs> knowledge of Evan prison. And she said that the equipment used by the Khmer Rouge it was not particularly creative. It's not the same equipment that, that all torture centers use, uh, countries that torture their people. They, they have this kind of equipment. The Khmer Rouge did have an obsession, though, which was to document everyone that came through that center. And um, here you have mothers with their babies uh, who would soon be all dead, um, uh, literally infants, uh, boys. Uh, accused of being CIA and KGB agents at the same time, uh, documented uh, before uh, extermination and um, uh, in killing fields that, uh, that dot the, the countryside. Uh, there's one in particular that's well known uh, called Chung Aik uh, in the outskirts of Pampan, about 10 kilometers from Pampan that you can go to and, and see the, the remnants of, of all the, the, the skeletons that remain there. But uh, to bring you back to my own story, one day in, in late 1975, around uh, sunset, uh, my parents got word, uh, or the, the village chief, commune chief, who was Khmer Rouge, had sent word that, that uh, uh, Vietnamese citizens would be allowed to return to, Cambo uh, to Vietnam. If, the, if you claim to be Vietnamese, you'd be allowed to return to Vietnam. Now, what were my parents doing at that point? They were in Persat province, forced to grow rice, which they did not know really anything about. They're city dwellers. Uh, to send them into the countryside to do this it was absolutely uh, uh, torture. Uh, and at, at a meeting that, that evening, the, the Khmer Rouge, you know, announced this news of, you know, our, our comrades in Vietnam are, are desirous of their citizens back. And so... Uh, my parents decided to take the chance. Now, my mother spoke some Vietnamese. My father did not. But, you know, that, that was just like, let's just, you know, take a, take a chance at this opportunity. And it could have been a trap, certainly. It could have been a way to figure out who's Vietnamese. Because, uh, you know, 
they were at that point friends, but they would later become enemies, uh, the Khmer Rouge and the Vietnamese. So it would take several months, but finally they announced that it's time to, you know, if you're Vietnamese, you start your journey, start walking and going towards a certain direction. Uh, but in, in, in that journey, just on the third day of our journey towards Vietnam, my father, who had been sick already with dysentery and malnutrition, passed away. So he uh, would have been a problem uh, because of his lack of Vietnamese uh, language ability, uh, which I think would, is a very Thunderbird thing, right, to have the foreign language. My mom used to say, if you speak a foreign, uh, another language, you'll know if they're going to take you to, to your death, send you to your death, you, you'll be able to find out and, and stop them or run away before it's too late. Um, but um, so he passes away and it's just my mom and five kids. And so it takes us now to act two to, to Vietnam as the, the next uh, stage of the story. And my mother, bless her heart, was able to use language uh, as her passport uh, to Vietnam. And um, here, uh, the four kids, this is already uh, when we've, we've survived the ordeal. But, uh, you know, uh, at that point, she's got these five kids at this um, these, are, these are the five kids. And um, during that journey, what happens is she finds out actually that her Vietnamese is terrible uh, because a Vietnamese, a real Vietnamese lady who is also going to take the test tells her that uh, she has given all the boys, girls names and all the girls, boys and all the boys, girls names. Anyway, she's mixed up all the names because she had renamed all the kids Vietnamese names instead of Cambodian names so that they fit the story better. And so um, if she had insisted that these were uh, the kids names, she would have been found out as a fraud. Uh, so this this lady, this good Samaritan. Uh, helped her and tutored her and basically was a drill sergeant of Vietnamese language for three days with my mother in the jungle and helped her improve her Vietnamese before the exam. And uh, as a result, we were able to get into Vietnam. Past, past, she was able to pass that. She had told us to uh, pretend that we were all sick so we wouldn't be asked questions because we didn't speak Vietnamese. Anyways, I was too young. As you can see, <laughs> I was a baby. Um, we finally get to Vietnam and uh, she's got you know, family there that are able to help. It's another incredible story that I won't get into because we don't have all the time here to, to detail it. But this is my mom here. This is me. And uh, she's and my mom has a sister uh, living in Vietnam and, and her husband basically comes and rescues us uh, after we get to Vietnam because it's not like, hey, you get to Vietnam, you're free now. Vietnam is a communist country and they want to send you into a re-education camp. And so it is thanks to uh, my uncle, who come, who somehow, my mom meets a friend in the market, tells her, go tell, blah, 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 you know, word gets to him, he comes down the river and saves us. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's really the incredible nature of life, the fact that there are people willing to help, there are friends that you know, um, which is very, very Thunderbird-like, incidentally. Um, but... So mom is there. Let's see. Uh, my uncle and aunt are there. And that's a precocious me. And my mom didn't want us to simply just stay in Vietnam because people were leaving Vietnam by boat as boat people uh, in any case and, and braving waters and, and danger and shark infested uh, South China Sea, um, Gulf of Thailand waters to get to freedom. Uh, we didn't actually have to do that because my mom was, was smart enough that the moment we got to Vietnam, she said to the Vietnamese authorities that we're actually not Vietnamese, we're Cambodian. And so they didn't have a real reason to keep us, uh, like to force us to stay in Vietnam. And so she, um, uh, she was able to then argue that, that okay, well, we should be allowed, allowed to leave. But of course, you have to pay bribes, you have to do all kinds of things. And in, order, in the only country that had diplomatic relations with um, with Vietnam uh, post-war at that point was France. So that was our only option uh, to find a way to get to France. And uh, France required at the time that you have relatives, uh, some kind of blood relatives with the same last name that are willing to sponsor you. And we had a, I had a cousin who was studying at a French university, but he had a different last name and he was poor. In fact, he was so poor that he lived in, in a one bedroom without any bathroom facilities, just a toilet. 
Um, and uh, he was despondent, trying to help us. But one day he bumps into a Frenchman who randomly on the street, who decides, a chain smoking Frenchman, who decides that, that he is going to help us. Uh, this other good Samaritan, he's going to find a family with the same last name in the phone book, which he does. Um, this French gentleman named uh, Bernard Guillader does. He finds a, a woman with the same last name, tr convinces her to sign the papers to say that we're related, uh, that she's related to my mother so that, you know, technically she's able to be sponsored. And then he takes the, the papers get lost in the mail, but then he ends up forging her signature somehow, uh, goes to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, to the, well, to the Ministère des Relations Extérieures and files this paperwork and, and tries to basically uh, argue with that. I mean, yeah, at that point, they, they say they're closed already for the day, but he just jumps the, the gate and, and goes in and, and, and bangs on the desk to say that uh, it's not yet time, right? It, it, by his watch, they, sh they should be closed yet. Uh, but by that miracle, we're able to get to France and, and to safety. We, we fly out of Vietnam, of communist Vietnam, and, and, and end up in France where um, here my sister and I in France and, and the rest of the family eventually decide that, you know, our next step is to, you know, well, we'd lived in France for about seven years. France was, was, was fine as a country, but it wasn't giving us opportunities uh, at the level that we'd hoped for. And, and for that, uh, my mom had another sister um, who lived in California and who said, you know, she, uh, she wanted us to rejoin her. In fact, the original plan was not to stay in France at all. We were supposed to just stay there for a few months and then go to the United States. But my mom decided that she was tired of traveling. Uh, my sister was sick. We're, we're just going to have to stay in France. And it ended up being seven years. And it, it, it kind of broke that relationship between her and her sister. But eventually they reunited when in 1985, summer or so, my aunt came to France to visit us and um, so she hatches a plan to get us to the United States, and it is uh, on these very this very uh, plane ticket, uh, dated October second, nineteen eighty five, that we fly to the United States. So Act uh, Four, if you're counting, um, America is our next stop. And you know, life in the United States can be very difficult. We I lived in in a basically a shack. Now it's been totally gentrified. The whole neighborhood in Oakland, California that we lived in, Temescal, is very hip. There's a $2 million house in that location. Uh, but our Christmases were threadbare, uh, kind of, uh, you know, plastic uh, Christmas tree and uh, no lights. Uh, Mom worked in uh, sewing factories, exactly this factory here um, up in Oakland's Chinatown, above a Cambodian restaurant, ironically. And we lived on food stamps. And I started uh, in 1980, uh, in, the, in January 1986, going to Willard Junior High School, where I um, began to get my American education. And, and Willard is now Willard Middle School, but it was in Willard that I took my first class, uh, English as a Second Language, ESL. And I would have been in ESL uh, all of my high school experience, but for the fact that one day when you know, you're going from uh, junior high school to high school um, at Berkeley High School. I was in the cafeteria and of Berkeley High School. And I meet, of all people, uh, you know, we're supposed to go there to, 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 um, to sign up for classes for ninth grade, right? So, so I had this tutor back at Willard, and she happened to be at that cafeteria that day. And she tells me, you know, if you ever want to go to the University of California, you've got to take the A through G requirements. And that means taking four years of English. I don't know why I listened to her that day. I just decided, okay, makes sense. I'm, I will quit ESL and I will take regular English. And this uh, tutor who was a volunteer at Willard and happened to be at Berkeley High School that day, another good Samaritan, um, convinces me to do that. It was the only day uh, a few weeks later that I ever saw my mother at Berkeley High School when I started Berkeley High School um, that she appeared suddenly. And I was like, what, what, mom, why are you here? And she said, oh, I, was I got some paper saying you need I needed to come to sign something. And it was to sign me out of ESL. So that was the, 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 the one time ever that I saw her at my high school. Um, 
While I was at Berkeley High School in 11th grade, I was asked to go to a meeting at UC Berkeley uh, with at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies. And it was organized by the director of the uh, center. And he had a couple of people there and they were, uh, I don't know, they were just there to talk to us, high schoolers from Southeast Asia, Cambodians, Vietnamese, Laotians, et cetera. And one of them was a man by the name of Bob who, who said that, you know, he, he works in admissions. He uh, wanted to uh, be helpful. He wrote his phone number on the cover of a UC University of California application. And I thought, okay, great. You know, thanks, Bob. I don't know who you are, but I'm going to apply. And so I did apply and I was uh, rejected from UC Berkeley, uh, which was a real disappointment because living in Oakland, Berkeley was the only place that I could possibly go to school at. It was uh, commuting distance bus wise. I didn't have to live in a dorm. We couldn't afford that. I didn't have a driver's license. We couldn't afford it. Bob. And I remembered that he'd written his number. And by a miracle, I still had that application with the cover that had his phone number written on it. So I called up Bob and I walked through these doors here into the basement of Sproul Hall where Bob's office is located. He tells me to meet him. And together we work on a plan to write a letter of appeal that uh, he tells me, do not send it to the director of admissions. Send it to this woman named Pat Burnett. I had no idea who she was. She was not the director of admissions, but um, he knew what to do. And uh, by a miracle, a month later, I got a letter uh, from Berkeley saying that reconsidered my application and I had been admitted to, to Berkeley at age 16 at the time, which was uh, really incredible uh, as an experience being in such a, such a large place. Um, a few years later, Bob, uh, was in the newspaper and, I, and I, I was reading this announcement that said Bob Laird was his last name has been named the director of admissions at UC Berkeley so he knew what he was talking about he just was in the background he was apparently an insider for sure um, but it's not the only place right it's 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 where I eventually at Berkeley find a flyer for uh, what was then known as the uh, Ford Foundation or Woodrow Wilson Foundation, uh, uh, National Foundation Public Policy and International Affairs Program. That was the antecedent of PPIA, um, of the PPIA program. And that's where I ended up, up you know, I saw this, this, this uh, uh, poster on the wall that had these ripoff cards. And I thought, oh, there's this, you know, it says there's a Junior Summer Institute at, at Princeton. And I thought, Princeton, now that's near New York. And I really wanted to go to New York. I really wanted to see New York. And so I ended up sending out for the applications for the Princeton JSI and the Berkeley JSI. And in my mind, I was never going to really actually go to Princeton. I was just going to apply to the to both of them, to the Berkeley one and the Princeton one. And then I would probably just go to the Berkeley one because it was safe. It was near home. I wouldn't have to venture outside my comfort zone. And the irony is that the Berkeley uh, JSI rejected me and it was the Princeton one that took me in. And, and I was for sure not going to do it because I was like, fly across the country, meet strangers. I'm an introvert. Okay. I, I couldn't possibly handle it. Um, but I get an I at, at some point in the process, I get an email from uh, Wardell Robinson Moore, who uh, was the associate dean of admissions at, at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. And she uh, and I thought it was a man, by the way, because I had no idea what Wardell was, gender pronouns, whatnot. So I just thought, OK. And Wardell says, you know, and I say, you know, I'm really not going to do it. I can't I can't imagine doing this. And Wardell convinces me uh, it, with her kind words that. It's totally possible. I will do it. Um, I, they'll send people to the airport to pick me up. It'll be fine. And, um, and she's absolutely right. She becomes a, a friend of mine to this day. So yet another um, uh, a good Samaritan who decides to, you know, for some reason, believe in me, uh, which is how I ended up uh, being a PPIA at Princeton. So we're finally where the story is supposed to begin, half an hour almost into this talk, uh, but I will, I'm uh, more than halfway through. So good Samaritans have appeared throughout my life. Uh, I, I'm really uh, so grateful to that. And, and even in this webinar, 
uh, the, the, we're, it's full of Good Samaritans. Uh, and behind me, in fact, uh, are all the Good Samaritans on whose shoulders I stand. Um, so we can all be good to each other. We can all be Good Samaritans to one another. I, that's what I'm saying. You know, the, the tutor who randomly accosts me in the cafeteria of Berkeley High School to tell me to take uh, regular English classes and to get out of ESL, she was, she, she didn't have to do that. I mean, she just wanted to do that because she cared about me. Uh, and to whom much is given, much is expected. So Act 5, uh, the world, um, after, during Princeton, I, I have my classmates and I meet uh, one who, and I decide to have a workshop on how to build your own homepage. I don't know why, I knew how to do a little HTML coding. This is in 1995 or 96 or so. And I just decide, okay, fine, I'm going to do a volunteer to do this for my classmates, teach him how to do it. And um, one of the people who remembered my email, there a few students showed up and you know, I showed them how to do a homepage. Um, one of the people who, who remembered that I did that was looking for a, somebody to help on something called knowledge management uh, at the World Bank. And she was in the year after me. And as a result of that one thing that I did, she, she believed that I could be helpful to her uh, and to the team that she worked for at the World Bank uh, in an area called social protection, which I had no idea about. Uh, social protection turns out to be this area that's between, um, uh, that's in human development, uh, but not health, nutrition, population, and not uh, education. So, uh, for example, pension systems, reform, uh, uh, vocational training, um, uh, fighting child labor, all of those things end up in social protection. And so I ended up working on social protection, an area I'd never heard about, except that I lived on welfare, which is exactly what social protection really is about. So I'd, I'd lived on welfare. And two years later, I was working for the World Bank on, on international welfare systems and, and policies. And I got to do that uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. My first mission ever with the bank was to Algeria. And then it was to West Bank and Gaza. Uh, really an incredible experience. And then finally, I somehow finagled my way to get to do work on, on Cambodia, m the country of my birth uh, for the World Bank, fight, uh, doing poverty reduction work there uh, and helping with the poverty assessment of 1999. Uh, I got to found the Concord, what an incredible experience. Uh, and eventually uh, got to work at the United Nations Development Program while I was doing my PhD back at Berkeley at that point and ended up in the world's newest country at the time, uh, Timor-Leste, East Timor, working on democratic governance. Uh, the, the work that the World Bank and the UNDP try to achieve, in the words of Mark Malik Brown, who headed UNDP and who worked uh, as a vice president at the World Bank, I mean, it's a little lofty here, I, I'll say, but you know, he says there's no more noble endeavor in the fight for social and global justice and for peace and development. And I mean, you know, nowadays as a scholar, I look at the word development and I have to say, you know, is it always good? Because uh, in, when you talk to a Cambodian farmer, for example, about what does development mean to you, uh, you might get the answer that development means they build a road and take away my land. So development, the, the encounter with development isn't always, you know, flowers and you're going to get rich and if somebody is going to get rich you might actually end up losing your land but anyways becoming a dean act six um you know after the experience with undp i finished my phd at berkeley end up um becoming a a, um, a postdoc at the maxwell school of syracuse university and then uh, uh become an assistant professor of national security affairs at the naval postgraduate school for seven years then uh, a um, associate professor of diplomacy and world affairs at Occidental College, which is a liberal arts college in LA. And then about a year and a half, uh, uh, almost two years ago, ended up at Thunderbird um, as uh, then associate dean for undergraduate programs and global development, and now as senior associate dean for um, of, of student success. But this is our beautiful new headquarters in downtown Phoenix um, at one global place. Uh, Thunderbird is uh, the number one master's in management uh, in the uh, Wall, Wall, Wall Street Journal Times Higher Education rankings. 
Uh, it just got named uh, the number one uh, in the world for international trade um, by the QS World University Rankings. And it's, of course, part of Arizona State University, which is the number one in the U.S. for innovation uh, in the U.S. News and World Report. So I don't know how I ended up as, as an associate dean or as a dean, as, as how I entered administration. All I know is that as a scholar, I was interested in answering questions about you know, foreign aid, here my first book, Aid, Dependence in Cambodia, Have Foreign Assistance Undermines Democracy. Then my second book, you know, The Hungry Dragon, How China's Resource Quest is Reshaping the World. And then my most recent book uh, released last year, Viral Sovereignty and the Political Economy of Pandemics, What Explains How Countries Deal with Outbreaks. I mean, the, I'm a scholar. I try to be a um, pracademic, as they call it, uh, uh, practitioner and academic. And I continue to serve on boards like the Center for Kamaya Studies, the Internet, I'm now the president of the International Public Management Network. Um, I am on the board of Refugees International, a, uh, an advocacy organization for refugees and the board of Partners for Development. And I get the occasional opportunities to uh, close the bell at the NASDAQ, for example, or to serve as chair of the Asian American and Pacific Islander Advisory Board of the Los Angeles District Attorney. Um, but uh, in the end, and I know we've only got a few more minutes of this me talking to you, but I, I would love to hear your questions afterwards, is um, it all goes back to my mother, right? That's, that's this person who is shown here in a photo mosaic of images of her who had seven years of schooling, uh, formal schooling, uh, spoke five languages and, and saved lives. You know, the Talmud says um, that uh, if you save a life, uh, you save the world. And the Chinese have a similar proverb, whoever saves a life is responsible for that life. So, you know, my mom is certainly responsible for my life, but also for my siblings' lives. And and uh, as a result of her saving us, uh, we begot our children. And so at this point, 22 lives uh, resulted in what she was able to do. Uh, the red ones are my own kids. I have four. And wherever she is now, uh, Mom got six months with Stephen, my oldest, uh, because he was born right around March of, of 2009. He just turned 14. Um, you know, I think she would be proud that we've been able to make a life for ourselves and to continue this journey. Um, so anyways, I've already spoken way too much. I hope um, that I can answer uh, questions you might have about this this blessed journey that I've, I've been able to experience going from, you know, um, refugee to PPIA, JSI fellow to uh, a dean at Thunderbird. Um, and it's, it's been such a, an incredible experience uh, that I think we can all, uh, you know, appreciate in our own ways, in your own journeys, all the things that, that you've, you can be thankful for and grateful for and blessed for. Anyways, thank you. Thank you, Sabal. That was, that was a great, a very inspiring. Uh, talk that you just gave. I learned a lot of new things about you that I didn't know. Um, I wanted to give this opportunity to open it up to the audience. Um, feel free to write your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and mute your mic if that's easier for you. Um, so yeah, anyone feel free to start with your questions. Yeah, and we're just a few people here. So just do, do whatever you feel like. Uh, it's recorded if it's, you know, it, it can be edited out. <laughs> there's a problem with it. So go ahead. We're just having a, you can just unmute and talk to me. I'm, uh, several of you are my students. I, I just appreciate the fact that you're here listening. Uh, Omar uh, uh, is writing, thank you for the, you, you, the recent history. I completed my mountain degree. Oh, Omar, you're, yeah, thank you. I know you're, 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 you, you're with Kamonix out in, um, uh, uh, in Pakistan, I think, but I don't know where you're actually based these days, but yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, Fred, Lizeth, uh, Trambak, come on, Trambak, what's going on? Genevieve, it's good to see you. Folks don't want to turn on, turn on their cameras. Okay, Trambak, you've, you're unmuting, go ahead. Hi, Professor, it's nice to see you. Uh, really nice to hear your talk and the fact that you shared your story made me really feel connected. Sure. Um, I don't Pleasure. really have a question, but off the top of my mind, if I had one, we know that we're going through a slightly slower economy right now, and it's 
slightly harder as an international student to find jobs. How much would you recommend just the students on this call or maybe me to pursue uh, after a master's, a doctorate, a postdoctorate? What are your thoughts given the economic climate? Yeah, I mean, I look, if I had known that uh, I would eventually uh, uh, end up on this journey of, of, by the way, I did mention in my talk that uh, I was absolutely convinced that I would never be an academic. In fact, I told Berkeley when I was doing my PhD, don't worry, you don't have to make me uh, uh, teach anything, be a teaching assistant. It's okay. I will. Uh, I, I, I will. I won't ever be a professor. I guarantee it. And and I was convinced of that because after all, I'm I'm this introvert who 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 hates speaking in public anyway. <laughs> so how would a job speaking in public constantly in front of students make me feel? But uh, constant anxiety, I suppose. But anyhow, it's it's it, all I can say is three masters. You know, I took a very long road. Uh, Trembag, you, you, you could have, you, it, it, can you imagine wasting your time just doing a bunch of masters before deciding that, oh, actually, you know, what I need is a, is a PhD, what I would like to achieve. And then after getting, you know, getting the PhD so that I could, in theory, it was like, so I could work in international development and be an international bureaucrat. And so I thought, okay, yeah, because everybody at the World Bank had, had PhDs. I thought, yeah, oh, I'm going to get a PhD because they all have PhDs. So I can't compete with them unless I have a PhD too. And then it was like, wait a minute, okay. My professor said, my, my dissertation chair said, if you don't go and try, if you don't try academia in the next three years after getting your PhD, your, your knowledge is gonna be too outdated to actually enter academia. Cause it's like, it's like this shelf, there's an expiration date yeah. stamped on my forehead or something like, yeah, yeah, you had the latest knowledge, but now after three years, you're, you've expired. You're, you're, no, you're, no, you're no good to us anymore. And so what's fascinating is that um, yeah, okay, so I tried to do the, the postdoc and I decided, okay, let's, let's, let's try it, let's do it. And then it's like, ah, I randomly walk into an assistant professorship. And I remember what happened was when I got the postdoc, I, I talked to the guy who I was, who was the associate professor that I was kind of teaching for that one year. And I said to him, how did you get your job? And he said, oh, I went to this uh, conference, uh, the American Political Science Association conference, APSIA. I said, what? I've never heard of APSIA. And he says, oh yeah, go to APSIA. They'll interview you. They'll have, they'll set you up with interviews there. You know, matchmaking type of stuff. And and I did. And then that's how I ended up meeting my next opportunity. But to your question, Shambak, you know, those who those who have a, a a thirst for wanting to interrogate things, like I just am never satisfied with like whatever I'm told. It's always like, okay, I have to think a little more deeply about this, or I want to write things, or I want to explore more deeply these ideas, that's, that's the kind of people who maybe think that, okay, I'm, I'm just not willing to accept whatever is told to me as a given. It has to be uh, further examined and questioned. Uh, it's great as an academic, it's not good when you work for a boss, to say the least, because bosses usually just want you to like accept whatever it is they tell you to do and just do it, right? So, so that's, 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 that, that's kind of a, an, an interesting thing. The autonomy from academia, I can tell you, is is uh, for, especially if you're just a professor, is incredible. You teach your classes, you have your office hours, you do your own research. You don't have to do nine to five, 40 hours, 60 hours, whatever. You're just kind of doing your thing because outside of the teaching and office hours, nobody is expecting you to constantly be in your office or to be like just waiting to, you know, for FaceTime or something with the boss. You, you don't really have a boss yet. Yeah, you have the department chair or the dean or whatever, but they're not watching you in that in the same way. So Trumbach, if what I told you just now sounds kind of interesting in terms of, um, you know, this is the kind of, you know, the pursuit, the thirst of knowledge, the, the you know, and then the never ending years of tenure process in terms of, six, seven years of waiting to see if you can get tenure and so on. If that sounds interesting to you, then go for it. Or, or there are people who also just want to just, you know, write things and bring knowledge and they don't necessarily have to be a professor. They, they could just do it without, without any kind of title per se. Uh, you know, it, it's all up to you in terms of what's, what purpose do you, do you feel satisfied with in life? Is, is your purpose to, you know, uh, answer questions research things uh, and discover new things or is it you know or whatever it is that makes you feel satisfied that's that's the most important thing 
we all have just a quick follow up yeah, uh, yeah. for example for when you do a postdoc you can also be um, working researching on the side as well as taking classes like you would be doing or you can take some time out to study to do your phd and go back into yeah. the industry because i'm sure that's yeah, also an sure option. sure industry is always the the kind of the alternative universe right you you can go academia you can go industry but 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 to generally speaking if you're a postdoc you're no longer really a student anymore at that point you you've gotten your phd and you're just you're trying to kind of be an apprentice academic because yes. it's a temporary situation in one year but you know the reality is the job market for academia has become such that you could be a postdoc for many years and it's this kind of purgatory of like what's going to happen next how many more postdocs do i have to go through right i just want to be realistic to you uh, the whole kind of system is falling apart because there's the there's the people who are tenured and then there's people people who are not tenured and they are always in this kind of precarious situation underpaid without security job security it's it's just not not great i, I just want to lay that out that's the sad reality okay Suka, you but you've had a wonderful answer. journey so thank you yes, for sharing. thank you thank you Trambak. so go ahead yeah um it was really nice to hear more about like your own personal story and that's something that like we've both talked about my dad also went through something similar like escaping the gulf war and i don't know how he managed here but he ended up here <laughs> But um, I think like for me, I was just kind of curious more about like, I know in the past that you said like the UN and the World Bank are like the world's largest bureaucracies, right? But oh, like- yeah, I mean, I was surprised by one of our students. I don't know if you were in that class, but one of, one of the students I had had uh, gave a figure of half a, half a trillion dollars had been spent on the UN since its founding. And I was like, what, are you sure that you make up this number? But I think it's accurate. It's just, you have to just add, if you just add things up and maybe net present value or something, but it's, it's, it's a large bureaucracy to say the least, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was just kind of wondering, like I'm kind of in this limbo now, where, like I'm graduating in May and I have a whole bunch of experience working with refugees, but I'm not really interested in working in the UN and the world thing anymore. Like it just kind of That's seems fine. like- That's Yeah, I just fine. don't know where- like where I should go next if like you have any insight on that like with your sure experience. yeah no not that I have not that I can tell you where to go next but I, I you mm. know what is it that fulfills you basically what 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 do you believe is is your your life's purpose your mission like what gives you the most satisfaction right I mean I it, the the way we've we've kind of treated uh, work these days, or even education is a kind of like, okay, well, what, what will make you the most money? And it's like, but wait a minute, if only if people only do things that make the most money, then you'll have you'll end up with too many financiers and, and, and just lawyers. And, and you know, that's not necessarily what we need more of. Uh, uh, so, you know, what is it that that you because I know you're very artistic, Tuka, you, you might want to think about how art and the kind of the, the, you know, how that satisfies you in terms of a, a purpose having to do with helping, you know, marginalized communities, helping refugees, helping, um, you know, people who've, who've been disenfranchised. I know that, you know, it's kind of like this, how does art pay the bills basically, but, but there, could, there, there, there are some people who are able to make a living from it. And, and there are people who obviously do art because that's what, they actually are passionate about and then have to do something else in the daytime to kind of, you know, keep the lights on. Um, but you're graduating and congratulations on that. Um, uh, what, so what are you looking at? What, what, what kinds of jobs are you applying for? Um, so I have just kind of been applying for everything, to be honest, like I'm doing mostly development work, like localized development. I've applied for like a few firms here that do, like infrastructure development for the reservations. Um, mm -hmm. But that, that's what I'm mostly interested in is like how economic development impacts things. And like my own personal research in undergraduate was like kind of about that and like the spillover from refugees and how that affects like the economic impact of these neighboring countries. Because right, it's like, right. it's really fascinating. So are, you, are you familiar with IRAP, the uh, International Refugee Assistance Project? 
or I think originally it was the Iraqi, the Iraq uh, uh, Refugee uh, uh, Assistance Project, IRAP. Okay. They're one of the major uh, organizations that, that does work in, 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 I mean, it's not local here, but you know, you, you could look at, at, at uh, the overall refugee sort of uh, work community as, as a possible area of interest. Um, just, just, oh, Omar is writing uh, some more, okay. Uh, but I don't know if it was to help you with 10 years experience in war zone working on command becomes our best option. Oh yeah, there you go, there you go. Um, yeah. Oh, and Jeremy, the folks are just chiming in <laughs> with all kinds of advice for you. I don't yeah. have to do all the thinking here. This, okay. is, this is great. This is great. I'll, I'll say I'll save I'll save the chat somehow. I'm sure I'm sure uh, uh, Dinesh, you, you you can you can help do Danish. You can you can help do that. By the way, Danish is our our our, our newest addition. We're trying to get him from Canada here. Um, it's it's been a challenge uh, uh, with uh, with with uh, uh, customs and border patrol to say the least. But we 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 are getting him to Phoenix, and you are going to watch weekly Sun, uh, Phoenix Suns games, my friend. Uh, so <laughs> this this will be your reward once you're here. So yeah, I I think that that you know you you're okay, the challenge that you're facing is that it's the same thing that I faced because I was like out of undergrad, straight into grad school, like very little actual real world work experience. And uh, we occupy a kind of space where it's like, okay, your normal employer is going to look at you and say, is this person really, um, you know, work ready or, you know, how would they operate inside a business environment or an office setting or, or whatnot? And it's, it's a matter of like, getting that first shot really you being you know being given a chance but um uh you know in terms of community economic development impact there there's there's of course always you know all the all, all the possibilities in, in in local government here i'm here at asu west today uh, mayor kate gallego was just speaking and, and and governor katie hobbs was just speaking so you know you're next to the power seat of of government here there there, there there's there's got to be ways in the net when the in the thunderbird network for you to actually be able to impress upon in, uh, you know the folks who 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 have the jobs that you've got something to contribute your voice matters i, I mean it, 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 i i hate to use a, a, a roomy quote here from one of his poems but you know it's like you're not a drop in the ocean you are the ocean in a drop yeah just remember that yeah well thank you and thanks for everybody that like was giving all that feedback yes. i really appreciate that the team effort all right anybody else genevieve fred jeremy uh we did, we did so -called ask president about, about the yes. dpp program um, just oh the dpp omar yes yes i shouldn't betray confidences omar i mean but i know you're very interested in that and um uh, yes, I mean I think the DPP is is uh, is a uh, ideal program for individuals who don't want to become a professor. Like I, you know, if your idea is I want to be a, a classic old school professor, I'll just tell you right now, DPP is not designed for that. It's much more of a practical thing where you're trying to essentially you could be a professor of practice, but it's for people who have many years of experience who want to turn their experience into something that they can, uh, you know, delve more deeply into in terms of a case study or in terms of, you know, uh, uh, writing uh, research on that. But it, it's not your classic, you know, I'm going to be uh, a scholar who is only interested in theory. That will not be what the DPP is about. Um, but in terms of, of, of opening a new avenue for those who, who aren't your traditional, because, you know, basically, let's be honest, okay, your, 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 your PhD that goes into academia probably went from undergrad straight into the PhD, no work experience, then became, you know, a master at writing esoteric papers that nobody can read or understand, and then, you know, becomes like, you know, just really good at that stuff, but that's not necessarily 
uh, the, the, the thing, certainly not what Thunderbird does in terms of or wants to be you know, full of. We, we want to have those people who know the theory, but also can link the theory to the real world and explain things in a in a way that that makes sense. So uh, when I when when you know when certainly you know from when I taught uh, five seventy five global affairs, I, the interest there was how to how to bring questions about Ukraine into the theories of international relations and global affairs that we that we know of. You know, liberalism, uh, realism, etc. And how can they help explain things? But not to you know, be wrapped around theories for the sake of theories themselves. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think I think uh, it's it's definitely an option for for folks who are um, who have many years of experience and who wanted who want to make a shift in their career, whether it's for their own satisfaction that they want to you know um, explore further. Because it, learning is never you know a, a, a there's there's never an end to it. You're always learning. And if you do it inside a more formal setting or less formal setting, it's it's what we're all supposed to do. But go ahead, Omar. Please ask ask. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. Like that was yeah. great. The thing is, like I was thinking of it when I started working like in war zones and like doing uh, being in management and senior positions. I was looking like on the articles, books, like how to learn like doing management and leadership. And the thing is, was like when I read something and I was reading it. I just was thinking like, okay, this person never left like a conflict area or war zone. Like they are yeah. behind this and just typing things. That's the was was the reason like I was interested in DPP program. I think, okay, my experience, I don't want to be like, like you said, like classic uh, professor yeah. out there. But like my experience now, I worked like in Iraq, South Iraq, Syria, Turkey, Ukraine. Now, if I get like a academic, knowledge to put all of that like in articles book to help others so that was my my view because i've seen a lot of people coming like uh expat internationals like i work with the un i have like a lot of negative impact from un people uh from like international organization they came to the areas they start working they implement some theories and methods of work that is came from like westward and the eastward and they don't apply and it's not related at all so that's why like i was thinking like if dpp yes serve that kind of purpose it would be great absolutely well look i it, that's exactly what i criticize in my courses that the idea of this cookie cutter you bring your you know your solution for one country and then you impose it on another country you have no context as to the history, the culture, the language, the people. You just think, okay, it's all the same. And, you know, that's what organizations like the IMF get accused of. You know, like they take a memo for country X and they go search and replace and change X to country Y instead. And then somehow a couple of instances of country X didn't get replaced. And then they get found out for having like totally straight up use the same memo for the two countries and it's embarrassing i mean that's like that's lazy thinking that's an inability to adapt to new situations where uh, where where you have to think critically and you have to um to to be to be able to be agile right and instead it's like oh i just want to i just want to impose the same thing everywhere and that's why people start, you know, <laughs> uh, protesting and burning uh, IMF uh, placards and effigy and so on, because they're sending the signal that this this is not good enough. This, you know, if the world is run this way, this is what can lead to conflict. This is what can lead to poverty. This is what can lead to 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 all of the problems that that we experience. I mean, when we talk about Thunderbird as you know a place where you know borders frequented by trade seldom need soldiers. It's also uh, borders that, that, that you, know, you know, places that have more understanding, more diplomacy, more uh, ability to think cross-culturally and have a global mindset can have less likelihood of, of war uh, as a result. So, um, so I welcome that, Omar. Thank you. I think that there was another similar situation when yeah. we worked, like during ISIS war. UNCR, they, they brought 
their plans from like Africa to implement like in Middle East. So like it's huge, like <laughs> they're out there. But thank you. I know. That's absolutely, what... absolutely. This is the danger. Always this lack of of critical thinking, which uh, you know I think we all know is the the essence of of this. What's missing, and even when you go to ChatGPT and write in questions, the answers make sense. But I I don't believe that. Uh, that there's actually deeper thinking going on. It's, 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 you know, it, it reads fine. It might pass in terms of like, okay, superficially it's okay, but it's not actually done anything to analyze the situation. It's simply repeating certain ideas. And if it repeats the wrong ideas, my God, we're going to be in big trouble <laughs> with, with uh, artificial intelligence systems that aren't, that, that are simply repeating the same mistakes of the past, right? That just blindly going back and taking whatever is assumed to be correct and going forward. All right, that is, should we, uh, what, what, anybody else? Last call for questions. I'm not seeing anything uh, in the chat. Yourself. Uh, yeah, look at the chat and see whether there's anything that I have missed. Don't think we missed anything. Oh, we good. Might then. be good to end at the webinar at this time. I did share my email. Um, I'll Please. share one more link. It's for the MGM program. I'll just share my email if you did have any questions. Yep. Yep. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you. for joining. And I know many of you just got my email out of the blue and just decided to hop on. So I really appreciate it. So thank you. Uh, for this last minute uh, uh, ability to join on this uh, webinar. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have bye. a great day. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.